So I'll, I'll first tell you about uh, the Big Bang Theory, and then I'll go to some of the puzzles that, uh, that remain in the, in, the, in the Big Bang Theory, which is then solved by cosmological inflation. Uh, so there are other names for cosmological inflation. It's also called cosmic inflation, which is shorter. And in, and us cosmologists, we, we just say inflation. So during the talk, talk, I'll just say inflation, and it should mean cosmic inflation and not the other inflation, which, which is also cool, but we're not uh, dealing with that today. So let me begin by giving you your first dose of cosmic perspective. It looks like it's needed uh, because of the weather today as well. We, we human beings are meter-sized creatures, so we are approximately one to two meters long. Uh, the Earth, where we live in, is almost 10 million times bigger in diameter than us. So that's pretty big. So if you go from the Earth to the solar system, our solar system is a million times bigger in diameter than the Earth. So, so we're already a factor of 10 million times, million times bigger. So when you go from the solar system to the Milky Way galaxy, which is the galaxy we reside in, the Milky Way galaxy is another million times bigger than our solar system. So we are 10 million times million times million times bigger. Can you guess what, what the next, <laughs> next one is here? When you go a factor of a million bigger? It's actually not one of these. So it's the size of the observable universe. So you might have thought the universe was bigger than what, it's, what it is. So, so we go a factor of 10 million when you go to the Earth, a factor of a million when you go to the solar system, a factor of a million more when you go to the galaxy, and a factor of a million more when you go to the whole observable universe. And it's quite remarkable that us tiny creatures can come up with a theory of the whole universe. So I find it very remarkable. Uh, and that theory is the Big Bang Theory. Most of you have already heard about it many times, I believe, even in the Saturday morning physics lectures. Um, and for that, we need, we need a physical law, so, and which is uh, provided to us by Albert Einstein. So it all started with, everyone is thinking Big Bang, but it all started with Albert Einstein, when he proposed his theory of general relativity, which which is a theory that relates space and time with matter and energy. So that is exactly what is needed for us to understand how the universe evolves in time. But uh, at the time, people didn't have the knowledge that the universe could be expanding, so everyone thought the universe is static. It does not expand or contract. So, so Einstein, looking at his equations, which were telling him that the universe could be expanding or contracting, added one extra term to his equation so that the universe cannot expand or contract. So that is called the cosmological constant. And someone from the Chicago basketball team had to convince him that the universe was actually expanding. So that person is Edwin Hubble here. So he, ac he actually did play basketball in Chicago and won three Big Ten championships when Chicago used to be a member of Big Ten. So I, I didn't know about this before I prepared this lecture, so, I was, so that's the most interesting fact I found out. I, guess. <laughs> I was very happy when I heard about this. And, and the way he did that is he looked at galaxies which are different than our own galaxy. Before his time, people didn't have, uh, be, haven't detected distant galaxies. So he saw these galaxies, and they appeared to be moving away from us. And the other thing, so here is an animation for that. The other thing that uh, he discovered that was the farther away a galaxy is, it appears to be moving faster. So in this animation, it looks like the, the galaxy at the center is not moving because that's the way the animation is made. You have to assume that the, the perspective. So, so this is being shown from the perspective of the galaxy at the center. If I do the same thing from the perspective of a different galaxy, then that remains at rest because you don't move with respect to your, yourself and all the other galaxies are moving away. And again, you can see the, fa the farther away a galaxy is, it's moving away faster. And this convinced Albert Einstein and other people at the time that the universe is expanding and, the, and it paved the way for the Big Bang Theory 
So we now know that the universe was smaller in the past, it was hotter in the past, and it was denser in the past. And it also therefore has a finite age. And if you remember the, the volume of observable universe I showed you in my first uh, slide, that look, it looked like, like a bunch of random points distributed in the space. So, so it looks same everywhere, which is called homogeneous, and it's isotropic, which is it looks the same in all directions. So there is no preferred direction. And this principle is also known as the cosmological principle. And it's true at large scales, and it's not true at small scales, because if I look here, I can see you guys. If I look here, I don't see you guys. So at small scales, the universe is not isotropic and homogeneous. But if you look at large enough scales, the scales of galaxies, then it, it looks almost the same in all directions, and it looks the same everywhere. Let's talk about the success of the Big Bang Theory, and not the television show Big Bang Theory, which I, I never understood why it's so successful. So I already talked to you about the Hubble's law, which is the expansion of the, which is the galaxies receding away from each other. So the Big Bang Theory successfully explains that. And there are many other observations that it explains, which is why it's very successful. Uh, so giving you some idea about that, it explains the abundance of elements in the universe. So using the Big Bang Theory, you can calculate how much hydrogen you expect today in the universe, how much helium you expect today in, in the universe. And you can, you can make these observations, and the predictions of the Big Bang Theory match the observations very precisely. And the Big Bang Theory also predicts the cosmic microwave background, which is also known as the relic radiation. It's the light particles coming to us from the past in all directions. So today, I, I will try to uh, give you a picture of how we get this light from the past. But before that, let's talk about when it was discovered. It was discovered in 1964 for the first time by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, for which they won the Nobel Prize in 1978. And it turns out they were not looking for this relic radiation. They were radio astronomers, and they were trying to make a very sensitive device, which is shown here, their telescope. And they, they observed a noise which was coming from all directions, which they couldn't get rid of uh, no matter what they did. So it turns out there were a group of people at Princeton at the time who were also trying, who were actually building an instrument to detect this cosmic radiation. And they heard that uh, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson actually found this noise which they didn't get rid of. And they interpreted that as the relic radi radiation from the Big Bang. So these guys didn't win the Nobel Prize, unfortunately, because they were a few years back. So to understand how we get this radiation from the past, the light particles coming to us, we have to go back, back in time, about 13.7 billion years ago, when the universe was just about 400,000 years old. And therefore, it was smaller than today. So it turns out it was about 1,000 times smaller than what it is today. So that turns out to be about 93 million light years across. It was hotter than today. So the temperature was about 3,000 Kelvin, which uh, is almost the temperature at the surface of, this, uh, surface of our sun. And more importantly, it was full of charged particles. So mainly protons and electrons. So protons are these positively charged particles that, that are inside our atom. And uh, electrons are negatively charged particles. And a bunch of photons, which are name that we give for light particles. So when I, whenever I say photon, it, it's a particle of light. And it turns out that photons, the light particles, they interact very strongly with charged particles, in particular the electrons. So you have these enormous number of light particles traveling across particles that are charged. So whenever they get close to one of the charged particles, they, they scatter off of it. So here is an animation to show you that. You can see the, the yellow dots, which, which are representing light particles here. Whenever they get close to a charged particle, protons, the red circles, or the electrons, the blue circles, they change their course. So therefore, 
we cannot see, we cannot use the light from this time to learn about the conditions of the universe because whenever we see things, it's because the light from that object is coming to us directly without getting scattered off. So it's like today we have, we have a cloudy day, so we don't see the sun. That's because the, the light from the sun is getting scattered off the clouds, right? But at this time, the universe is still expanding and therefore cooling, so the temperature goes down. And when that happens, the, the positively charged protons and the negatively charged electrons, they combine to form neutral hydrogen. So when the, when the universe is filled with neutral hydrogen, the light particles do not interact with the neutral hydrogen atmos, and they can now travel freely across the universe. To show you an animation here of this, now the, the yellow dots, which are the light particles, they don't interact as much with hydrogen and with the neutral hydrogen, and they travel across the universe much more freely. And this is what we detect as the cosmic radiation, the relic radiation today. So you can see this is happening at all the places in the universe. It happens at the same time, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And because of the finite speed of light, so light takes time to reach to us, we see today, if Robert, uh, if Penzias and Wilson had their instrument at the Earth when the Earth was just forming, like 4.6 billion, billion years ago, they would still see this radiation, but they will see it at a different temperature. It, it would be coming from a different place. Uh, right, and as the universe is expanding, the, the, light, the wavelength of light is also stretched by the expansion, and, and the, therefore we, we see the, the wavelength of the light is different today than, it, than when it was produced. That's why we, we see the light in the so-called microwave band, which is the wavelength of the light that we see. That's why this is called the cosmic microwave background. To give you an idea of the number of light particles that we have today from the microwave background, so there are roughly 400 light particles in one centimeter cube today. So if I could freeze time, so if I could stop all the light particles, so one centimeter cube is roughly the size of my thumb, probably smaller than this. So if I could freeze time, then I will see about 400 light particles there. But the light particles are moving very fast. They move at the speed of light because they are light particles, right? So if I use that speed, then I find that there are actually 1,000 trillion of them passing through this small size, the size of my thumb, each second. So that's a lot of photons. I cannot draw all of them in my animation, so I just show you few, few, less than 1,000 actually. The other important thing is we detect the light that is coming to us. But these, uh, these microwave light, they're going around in the universe at every point in all the direction, right? So because we see only the light that is coming to us, it looks like it's, a, it's coming to us from a sphere, so a spherical surface. I cannot draw a sphere very nicely, so I, that's why I'll draw a circle for that. So here is an animation to show you how the light from 380,000 years comes to us traveling about 13.7 billion years. So let's say that uh, in this circle, light is produced, uh, light is free now after neutral hydrogens are formed. And then when you go forward in time, the temperature is getting down as the universe expands. The outer circle is showing the expansion of the universe. So it, ha it has grown bigger since the time the microwave radiation became free. And it, it reaches to us now, today. So because the universe has expanded further than, than the time when the radiation was free, the, universe is, the size of the universe today is actually not 14 billion light years in radius. It has grown bigger, so therefore the size of the universe today that we can see is 46.5 billion light years in radius. And you may have heard that the, the universe is 93 billion light years across. So that, that's where the number comes from. So if someone asks you what's the size of the observable universe today, the answer is not 14 billion light years. It's 46.5 billion light years in radius. So what we actually observe is, it's shown as this plot. 
So this is a map of the sky. It's a two-dimensional projection of a spherical surface, the same way we do for the surface of the Earth. We don't want to carry globes around with us all the time, right? So we, what we do is we, we make a two-dimensional projection on a surface. This, the same can be done for the cosmic microwave background light, which is shown here. And this data was, is taken from the COBE satellite, which was a satellite mission to map these temperatures in the 90s and won the Nobel Prize in 2006. And it shows us that the, the temperature of the light coming to us in all directions is almost exactly the same, 2.728. And, and we call that the, the temperature is isotropic because it's the same in, the, in all directions. So this brings to us our first puzzle, which is why is the temperature of the light in all direction exactly the same? So to think about this, uh, so let's say consider one photon, which one particle of light, which comes from one side of the sky. And as I explained to you earlier, it takes almost 14 billion years for that light particle to reach us. And that's almost exactly the age of the universe. Similarly, if you consider for a light particle coming from the other side of the sky, it also takes almost 14 billion years for that particle to reach us. This means that these two positions of the sky could not have talked to each other. They needed almost 28 billion years for that to happen, and the universe is only about 14 billion years old. So, so therefore, in big, in big Bang theory, this is a puzzle. Why do the temperatures of all the points in the sky, why are they the same? It turns out this, uh, this puzzle actually gets worse because the, the, if you go to the time when this microwave radiation become free, then you find that the universe was only 380,000 years old then. So in 380,000 years, light, could, light travels even a smaller distance. So, so the different small yellow circles that I have there is the distance up to which light could have traveled from the center of each of these points, each of these circles. So, so you'll find these regions in which, which, were, which, which is what we call disconnected with each other. So they couldn't have talked to each other. So each of these circles could have never talked to each other, and yet the temperature is the same. It turns out if you do this on, on the whole sky, there are about 40,000 of these patches that could not have talked to each other, but yet the temperature is still the same. So, so it's, it's a puzzle. So either you say it's just the same, it's the way it is, or you try to find some explanation. So as you might have guessed, the explanation lies in cosmic inflation, which I'll come to back later. But before that, let's talk about one more puzzle in the Big Bang. So similar to the way we talked about uh, geometry in two dimensions, like the surface of the Earth is spherical, but you can also have a two-dimensional flat surface like the surface of this table. You can, we can talk about the geometry of the universe, in, which is, we know is in three dimensions. And it depends on the density of the universe. So if the density is bigger than some critical density, the universe is said to be closed and have positive curvature. If the density is less than some critical density, the universe is open and it's supposed to have a, and it's, say, it's a negative curvature universe. If the density is exactly the critical density, then the universe is flat and there is no curvature. It turns out we can, we can measure this, this curvature parameter, and we find that the density of the universe is very close to the critical density, and therefore the universe we observe is flat. And in an expanding universe, if you start with a, a very small positive curvature, that curvature will grow. It will become more positive. If you start with a negative curvature, that, curv that curvature will again become strongly more negative. So, so for, for the universe to be flat today, it had to be 
extremely close to flat in the early period. So this is, a, um, this is again a puzzle. So why is the universe so flat? So again, you can either say it's the property of the universe that it, it's exactly flat, or you can try to come up with an explanation for that. And one person did come up with an explanation whose name is Alan Guth, who, who was one of the first persons to propose the theory of uh, cosmic inflation. So he found out that in, in, in if, if the conditions of the early universe are suitable, you can have a very exponential expansion of the space in the very early universe, and that could solve both of these two problems that we talked about. The horizon problem, which is we have many patches in the sky which could not have talked to each other, yet they have the same temperature, and the fact that they, the density of the universe today is very close to the critical density. And if you can read the last sentence, sentence, I'll read it for you. It says, unfortunately, the scenario seems to lead to some unacceptable cons consequences, so mod modification must be sought. So he, so he showed that his theory is not complete. And then in the, rec in, in the next few years, there were other people who solved the problems of his theory, and, but, but kept the good parts of the theory that solved these problems. And that inflation is called new inflation. Alan Goose inflation is called old, old inflation. And there are many, many models of inflation and many cool names for inflation, like hybrid, hybrid inflation, eternal inflation, chaotic inflation, so you may have heard of these. But, but the underlying feature of the theory remains the same, that you have a very rapid period of exponential expansion during the early period of the history of the universe. And, and the property of the field that drives inflation is that the energy density remains the, almost the same with, with expansion. This is not uh, true about ordinary matter. In the, in the, in the in expanding universe, the matter gets diluted and the energy density decreases, but the, the field that drives inflation is like a vacuum field. It's similar to, the, similar to dark energy and the Higgs field that you may, you may have heard about. So in that case, the energy density remains roughly the same, even with expansion. And that property solves the flat, flatness problem. So that property guarantees that the, the universe is close to, very close to the critical density at the end of inflation. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how it solves these problems. And uh, I told you about, I told you that it, there is an exponential phase of expansion in the very early universe. So to give you some numbers, that happens a billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second in the evolution of it. So that's that's pretty small number. And and in that time, the universe increases in size by a factor of at least 100 trillion and trillion. That's almost the same as going from us to the size of the observable universe I showed you in the first slide. It's remarkable, like these big numbers, right? And, this, and, and the at least part comes because we want to solve the horizon problem. So if, you have, if, you, if the universe increases by this amount, then we don't have the problem that the different patches of the CMB sky didn't talk to each other. That means that all of the observable universe that you have today was inside a very small volume, and all the points could have talked to each other in that period of time. There is one more puzzle here. So it turns out the universe is not exactly homogeneous and not exactly isotropic. I showed you a map where the temperature was exactly the same on all the points in the sky. But now we can do better. We have better instruments, and we can measure the temperature more precisely. So if you do that, and if you zoom in, you'll find that there are slight devi deviations from that 2.728 Kelvin. And the deviations are very small. They're, they're 1 in 100,000. So you have to be very precise. And, it, and WMAP. Uh, and Planck satellite missions are the two recent ones that have mapped 
these fluctuations in the temperature very precisely. The blue points here are colder spots and the red ones are hotter spots. So the cold and hot here are relative to the 2.728 Kelvin. So it's 2.728 plus minus 0 0.0001, something like that. But, it, but we can do that. And the, so, and the puzzle, is, puzzle here is, why is the universe not exactly homogeneous, not exactly isotropic? So why do we have these fluctuations in the universe? Uh, it turns out having these fluctuations is actually a good thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. So the fluctuations are what create the structures in the universe. The planets that we see, the galaxies that we see, are because in the early universe, you had regions in which the density of matter was slightly higher at some point and slightly lower at other points. Then the, the, the denser region will attract matter surrounding it because of gravity, and they form planets, they form stars, they form galaxies. If the universe in its early time was exactly homogeneous, each point had the same density, then, then each point will, will not, so the, the point, the object there will not know which way to move. So every direction it's pulling at the same, the gravity is the same in all directions, so it wouldn't move at all. So, so having these small fluctuations is a good thing, otherwise we wouldn't exist at all. So the, so the puzzle is where do these one part in 100,000 fluctuations come from? Again, the answer is inflation. And, and it turns out it comes from quantum fluctuations during inflation. So inflation happens when the universe was very tiny, the energy scale was very high, so, so there must be quantum fluctuations. And when the universe expands, these fluctuations are stretched, and that's what gives us these tiny fluctuations that we see in the CMB, and that, that's what generates the galaxies that we see today. We can do very precise analysis of the maps that I've shown here. So these are very careful but sophisticated statistical analysis. And it turns out that the, the, after you do the, do the analysis, the data that we have matches the predictions from inflation very precisely. So even though the theory of inflation sounds quite crazy, because it matches with the data very precisely, we have, so that's, that's a good reason to believe that inflation might have actually occurred during the early universe, even though it's quite a crazy idea, right? So let me uh, summarize what I have told you till now. So the Big Bang Theory is a very simple theory in that the, the assumptions are simple and elegant, but it's also a very successful theory because it predicts many things that we see in the universe. But there are some puzzles which cannot be solved within the paradigm of Big Bang cosmology. Then you either assume that those were the initial conditions that were given to us, or you try to find some explanation. And it turns out that we have a candidate, a very good uh, theory that explains many of these puzzles and predicts things that can be observed with the fluctuations in the CMB. And as far as we can tell, the, the observations match the predictions very precisely. But inflation also brings new puzzles to us, which is a good thing because then we cosmologists have a job to do. Otherwise, <laughs> we'll be done if everything was understood, right? So some of the questions that <coughs> that cosmologists think about, uh, about inflation now is, what is exactly this field that drives the inflation? So you may, have, <coughs> you may have heard about the Higgs field, <coughs> which gives mass to the objects, right? So similarly, we want to know more about the nature of the field that drives inflation in the early universe. Are there more than one field that, that, that that are interacting or that are just doing something during inflation. So we want to know about that as well. What is the exact energy scale at which these 
this uh, inflation happens. So we know this energy scale should be super high compared to what the energy scale that we live in or the energy scale of the Large Hadron Collider where they smash particle to find Higgs, right? But we don't know exactly what the energy scale is. And we also want to know what happens at the end of inflation. So inflation has to end somehow, otherwise we'll still be exponentially expanding. We don't do that. So we want to know how it exactly ends and how does it give rise to the normal matter that we see today. So it turns out some of these um, questions can be, can be answered using upcoming observations. Uh, in the cosmic microwave background, we can observe uh, these patterns that you have, patterns in the sky. So on top of the temperature fluctuations, we expect uh, that there are patterns in the sky that tell us about the inflation. So you may have heard about this uh, B mode d detection a few years back in 2014, which, turned, uh, which were called uh, signals from the dawn of time or something. It turns out that was the signal from dust in our galaxy. Uh, but that doesn't stop um, us from building better instruments. And there are people even at Michigan who are involved in building better instruments to detect the B mode polarization, which, which, is, uh, which is the best uh, hope for us to learn about the energy scale of inflation. So if we detect these patterns in the sky, they will tell us exactly at what energy scale inflation was happening. Because uh, the fluctuations created during the inflation help us create the, the structure that we see in uh, the universe today, the galaxies that we see today, we can learn more about inflation also looking at the patterns in galaxy surveys, in the, in the galaxy distribution in our universe. In particular, what they tell us is are there multiple fields acting during inflation? And they also give us a better measurement of the, the curvature of the universe, whether the universe is isotropic in all direction, whether the universe is homogeneous. And if we find any deviation from isotropy, so if, or if you find any deviation from homogeneity of the universe, then that can be related to some dynamics during inflation. So, so we are hoping that we, we measure some of these in the future, and they tell us more about inflation. Uh, let me give you your second dose of cosmic perspective. So I told you that uh, during inflation, the universe expands billion, trillion, trillion times, right? Something like that. I even forgot the number. So the, that factor is actually very close to the, the ratio of the size of us human beings to the size of the observable universe. And we know, the, we know that the universe expanded from our size to the size today, but it took the universe almost 14 billion years to do that. But during inflation, the same thing happened. The inflation increased its size trillion, trillion times, actually more than that, 100 trillion, trillion times. But all of that happened at a fraction of a second. So almost trillion trillionth of a second, right? It's probably less than that. So imagine the speed at which that is happening. It's extremely fast. And that speed is actually greater than the speed of light. You may think that uh, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But in this case, the space itself is expanding. So that is not prohibited, and it does travel faster than the speed of light. So I just want to leave with this uh, picture and the second cosmic pros perspective that we can, we can learn so much about the early universe. And it's, it's quite amazing for me. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. <laughs>